Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry we're starting a little bit late. Uh, my name is Mehreen. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with an esteemed panel. We're also going to get a little late attendee, but I'll introduce them later. Um, we're going to be talking about the idea of global debt being on the brink, and I'm going to read out some scary numbers to you to start off with. So according to the IAF, global debt levels will reach 310 trillion at the end of 2023. They claim this to be one of the highest <coughs> amounts in peace times that we've seen in the global economy, although maybe we can debate whether we are really in peace time. Um, the World Bank has also said that for lots of emerging uh, and developing economies, the state of their debt servicing bills will balloon to about $450. Um, and this is among one of the highest on record. That figure is from 2022. We also have a landmark election year where 4 billion people, almost half the world's population, is going to vote. And there's lots of concern already that spendthrift politicians are going to be offering lots of blandishments to their voters to convince them to vote for them. And therefore, some of the progress that's been made on debt cons consolidation over the last couple of years will go into reverse and we'll see uh, an actual change in trend. And there's even some talk in some quarters, you may have even heard it in Davos, that the bond vigilantes are going to return. So the idea that foreign creditors and investors will finally decide that they've had enough of all of this debt splurge and they will force governments, some of whom are democratic, into retreat. And if there's anyone here of a British persuasion, you'll remember October 2022 as perhaps a moment the UK may have fallen victim of the bond vigilantes. So with all of that being said, we have a brilliant panel to help us discuss this. Uh, in a change to planning, we're not going to be joined by the Vice President of Nigeria, but the Finance Minister, who's just about to make his way into the room. But already with us, we have the President of Sri Lanka, Ronil Wickramasinghe. Um, we also will hear from Vera Songwe, who's Chair of the Board uh, of Liquidity and Sustainability Facility, Laura Alfaro, who is Wa Warren Alpert Professor at Harvard Business School, <coughs> and Ken Rogoff, who is Chair of International Economics at Harvard. Um, Ken, I'm going to start with you and maybe just problematize the notion that there is a looming debt crisis, because it seems that we often, in these types of circles, talk about some moment of reckoning for global debt. So will it actually happen in 2024? Well, I, I think the big issue is not just the size of the debt, but what's happening to interest rates. We had this period after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, where uh, interest rates just fell off a cliff. Now, inflation fell, but interest rates fell even more than inflation fell. And everybody got this idea, um, let's make everything, yeah, everything's free. So. That's certainly the case in my country, the United States, uh, and it took a lot of pressure off uh, everybody. And now I believe and I, uh, that there are very good reasons that that era is over, that COVID was a turn, the pandemic was a turning point, but it wasn't just the pandemic, a lot of things. Uh, we have uh, much higher debt, which uh, eventually feeds into higher interest rates it has. There's much more populism in politics, which is good. It redistributes income, but that pushes up interest rates. We have the green transition, much talked about here. I don't know, you know if it's happening on the scale that we need, but it's probably going to keep growing, and that's going to add to pressures on spending and interest rates. And I'm very sorry to say defense spending is almost certainly going to go up all over the world. And I, I could list some other factors. So that's the problem. Now, it's not the same for everybody. So the United States, I can tell you that if whichever side wins, if they win <coughs> big, really control things, they'll spend like crazy <coughs> on their constituency, what they want. I mean, the Republicans will cut taxes. The Democrats will raise taxes a little, but raise spending a lot more. And we already have 7% GDP debt, which is fine if you're in an epic recession, but we're actually in a huge boom at the moment in the United States. So that's going to end up in inflation. So uh, in the countries where they have uh, a number of advanced countries, eventually it's going to feed into inflation. But in emerging markets and developing economies, many of which were in trouble before interest rates went up, you know, I, the World Bank, I think, had said that half 
or more than half of all developing economies were effectively bankrupt before. And you know, this is, it's a, just an untenable situation. I actually don't think there's a, a resolution that doesn't involve a lot of debt write-downs and debt and transfers and debt forgiveness. Just to, we'll get to emerging markets, uh, I think, a bit later. But just to push you on the U.S., you're sort of uh, putting a bit of an equivalence on even if it's uh, the Democrats or the Republicans, they both carry with them fiscal risks. Uh, it, there seems to be an assumption that actually Trump carries more fiscal risk because of what, the future of the tax cuts, which are due to expire, that he generally will come with an <coughs> attitude of fiscal irresponsibility. And perhaps Biden, having done his splurge in his first term, won't actually present so much of a, uh, a looser fiscal oh, policy. I, if they I don't know about that. Policy. I mean... Biden didn't do his whole splurge. Uh, he just had a very thin majority. Uh, Senator Manchin and Christine Sinema, I don't know if you remember the names, but they were these two sort of Democratic senators, but they, they sort of cut off probably half the spending that he wanted to do. And there's lots more on deck that they want to do. No, no, no. I mean, I actually would guess that if the Democrats won big, you're going to get a bigger splurge. But it's, it's immaterial. I mean, I, I, I mean, if, to be honest, if Trump wins, I just have no idea what the policies are going to be. I suspect he has no idea what the policies are going to be, but I bet somehow it ends up in a, a lot bigger debt. Lara, what do you make of the issues around sovereign <laughs> debt? And perhaps is there beginning to be a bigger differentiation even among the markets or economists about richer countries trying to raise debt to meet new policy areas of spending like climate change, defense, um, sort of the advanced economy challenges? and what emerging markets are having to go through right now. First, let me uh, thank the organizers and, and for the participants. Let me just mention that I am humble because I have next to me Ken Rogoff, who is one of the persons in international economics with Carmen Reinhardt that not only have contributed to the theory of everything I know on this subject, but also to the empirics. But I also, I, I want to also refer to the practitioners who are here also in this panel and, uh, and are battling with this issue uh, every day. And, and so, again, I just want to be humble um, because I, I have theory and practice uh, next to me. I do want to say that in emerging markets, we, we do need to be careful because there's a lot of heterogeneity. I, my husband is from Brazil, I'm from Costa Rica. I always use this as an example that in this basket that we call it emerging markets, we do have uh, many types and many kinds and many colors and many flavors. But broadly, I think uh, within emerging markets, we have two big buckets. One is the ones that have maintained access to private uh, markets. I, I would put Brazil in this, in this bucket. Uh, uh, and then a subset that for many reasons haven't. Um, and so they continue to borrow a lot from multilaterals and bilaterals. And let me put perhaps Ecuador and, and Argentina on, on this other bucket, but, but there are some other examples. On the, on the ones that have remained in the, with access to the, the, to the private market, and again, this just again goes back to the fact that sovereign debt is a lot about willingness to pay. And so if you made an effort to stay with the private sector, you are actually putting effort to, to pay uh, your debts. A, an interesting thing happened. We have seen actually debt to GDP levels go down. Um, through a mixture, despite the fact that they were spending, through a mixture of growth, but also surprise inflation. And so because of the surprise inflation, the, the investors now see these countries as having lower debt to GDP, and some are like, it's not as bad as it used to be. And again, the numbers do give that sense. It's a little bit interesting because it's not as bad as it used to be because they had inflation, which is a form of default, but perhaps not in your face default. But many are of the view that it could have been worse, <coughs> and so, and everyone is bad, so let me continue to spend, eh, to, to, bar, eh, to lend to these countries. And again, there might be a reckoning, but many see, like, I need to be in this asset class, and they're all bad, so I'll continue uh, to give them money. It, despite the fact, as Ken mentioned, that many of these countries now are in good times, they're growing. If you're a Keynesian, you spend in bad times, you have to save in good times, and many are not saving in good times. But, but you do see investors there, and again, since there's a lot of bad apples out there, I actually do think that they're gonna continue to lend to, to these ones that are putting an effort. And then there is these other ones that, again, are, are complex, and that is the Argentina, the Ecuador, and some other countries. And, and this is more difficult because a lot of this is not 
private debt, it's multilateral debt, and it's bilateral debt. It's also interesting that a lot of these countries increase debt after a round of debt sustainability, and we have found out that the solution which may involve forgiving debt is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, things have to happen. There has to be export promotion. There has to be fiscal <coughs> management. And, and that is the part that is trickier because we have not found a way to create that so easily. In Costa Rica, when I was in government, I remember it was the time of very low interest rates. And I kept telling uh, the vice president, which was in charge of infrastructure, look, we don't have a problem with lack of money. We have a problem. We don't have good projects. And we don't have capacity to implement those projects effectively and quickly. And that continues to be the challenge. How do we create incentives for countries to use the money in ways that gives them growth and, and productivity and also uh, distribute it among all their people? President um, Lara sort of laid out the two types of countries. I think Sri Lanka falls into the, uh, a batch where it has had to go through a period of debt relief and have negotiations with bilateral creditors, including China, and is now facing the idea of how to pay this money back. So what is the outlook for Sri Lanka after its debt relief um, was negotiated, and, and so where do you stand now on the ideas of debt? No, we, we, uh, I, I must say we have performed well so far, and for the first time we've got positive growth. I would expect about 2% growth this year, and uh, maybe on to about 4 or 5 uh, next year. Uh, but as I mentioned, the ma main issue we have is how do you repay this, because we've had a balance of payment issue, <coughs> and secondly, we have a question of uh, budgetary uh, issues also. Revenue is not enough for the expenditure. So on the <coughs> revenue side, we worked with IMF. We are increasing revenue. And as growth comes in, there should be more revenue. We are also revamping our total revenue collection systems. And we want to have a revenue authority replacing the individual uh, departments. As far as uh, balance of payments is concerned, is how we attract new investments and what are the areas. We've looked at, uh, as a new, as a short term, we have looked at tourism, uh, agriculture modernization, which will also lead to exports, and renewable energy. We have a fair amount of solar and wind power far beyond our needs. How do you utilize it at the moment when there's a demand? And we are also going to sell part of it to. <coughs> India, but you, you have a bigger problem here. One is populism. You have the expectations of the people that have to be met, whether it's the United States or whether it's Lesotho. And most of us are living beyond our means, if you look at it in the conventional way. Then your bond markets, others, are at the moment, have to operate on the conventional rules. Now, how do you uh, have these two together? If you are going to apply the strict rules, all governments will collapse. So there's demand. You want housing, you want education, you have health, and this is not enough. So this is why, uh, in my view, you have got to sit down and take a view on this. Uh, how are we going to do it? Otherwise, this, is, this issue will go on. Your government must, at the end of the day, provide the minimum facility that's expected. Then in all our areas, all of a sudden, they want electricity into the village. They want roads into the village. We have to give water. So how do you, how do you, Sri Lanka has done that over a period of time. I mean, we ha it's not so bad for us. We got into this problem because we have none, we took the loans on non-tradable goods. No way of paying back, but all our villagers today have uh, paved roads. We have better buildings in schools. So that's, that's the, uh, so at the end of it, I can still say that part of it will help us for social development. But at the, uh, you have to resolve this issue in you know, Sri Lanka. We can manage it. It's a question all, I think, of Africa, you could say most. And Africa needs that money. They need the money. Just on this idea that you say Sri Lanka can, can achieve this, so talk about revenue collection, talking about taxes on households and businesses. Um, you are, you know, have an IMF um, you know, schema. Do you think this will breed any seeds of resentment among Sri Lankan populations later on, or you think that the country well, we, we, We've already right? had foreign investments. It's nothing new. Basically, from the time the Dutch came, they were investing. Then the <laughs> British invested. <laughs> now we are investing. We were the other. So it's, 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 it's I don't know if that something. means the IMF is a quasi-colonial power in what? Sri Lanka, but I uh, don't think that's what you mean. <laughs> yeah. 
So in any case, we, we, we can live with uh, foreign investment, and people are expecting foreign investment. So it's, it's, it's an open society. That, that's not a major issue for us. Uh, we think we want to make it on our own, but we don't want to add any more burdens, I think. But I am for debt relief for Africa. You know, just because we can handle it doesn't mean that African countries can handle it. We are for debt relief for Africa. Finance Minister Wale Aden, thank you so much for joining us at the last minute. It's much appreciated. Um, I don't think you missed too much of the beginning, but um, talk us through the situation in Nigeria. So at first blush, Nigeria is not a country which has an exploding debt burden. It's probably uh, the envy of lots of richer countries in the world in the region of around 40% of GDP, and even that is, is seen to be higher than it was in years previously. So how is Nigeria navigating an environment of high interest rates? And when you look around the region, so the President's already mentioned other countries in Africa and debt relief, um, what sort of role are you taking in that debate? Thank you very much indeed. And uh, apologies that I uh, came straight from another function a bit late. It is an honor to be here. It's an honor to sit next to Prof. Ken Rogoff and, um, and, and the rest of this distinguished panel. You know, it's a new... Uh, administration in Nigeria from May 29th, and um, even uh, as a president-elect, um, we've, 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 we've listened to and been part of the, the international dialogue right from the Paris Financing uh, Summit, G20, the World Bank uh, annual meetings, spring meetings, and then uh, the autumn meetings, and the, the refrain was always the same. Interest rates are elevated and are likely to stay that way while the rich world fights inflation. And therefore, you cannot look to debt as a means of financing growth, development, industrialization. Um, and we took that on board and realized that the answer had to be domestic resource mobilization. The answer had to be uh, fiscal prudence, managing expenditure better, um, and that's exactly what we've done. As you say, our debt levels are not too bad at all, about 38% as uh, uh, a percentage of GDP. And this year's budget has borrowing coming down. It has some element of privatization in there, but chiefly we have um, a 77% increase in, re in government revenues. Right now, our figures for government spending are too low. We, uh, we do envy Sri Lanka with their talk of their modern infrastructure. So government spending 10% of GDP is way too low. It has to be raised, but it can't be by debt. So um, recurrent expenditure is, is scheduled to go down because we've just made the cuts in, um, in various recurrent costs. Uh, capital expenditure as a portion of the total expenditure um, excluding debt service has gone up from just under 30% to over 50%. So that's where uh, uh, that, that kind of spending on, on infrastructure, uh, part of it will come from. But essentially, it's been all about um, really ensuring, and this was the, pres the, the promise of, of, of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu when he came, when he was campaigning, he said, look, um, things are very lopsided. Um, things are, I'm going to do th two things. I'm going to follow the rule of law, the sanctity of contracts, and in addition, uh, I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to confront, I'm going to engage, and I'm going to use state power to subdue the vested interests that give us this lopsided picture. And as a result, uh, and, and that, that those vested interests aren't just private sector oligopolists, they include within, you know, loose spending within public corporations. So just in January, we, 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 we've, um, we've linked up, uh, digitalized, computerized, and automated the financing system of government enterprises such that the share of their revenue that is due to government is taken automatically. And it's made a big sea change. So our, 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 our answer is not to, um, is to avoid where we see other people have got to, they're, 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 they're having to, uh, well, as Sri Lanka and some African countries, they're having to renegotiate their debt, they're having to go to this common framework. We're committed to staying away from that because we believe we have the resources to walk our way out. Thank you. Um, Vera, there's, a, there's an idea that you know, not all debt is equal. Some debt is good and some is bad. And 
uh, from the sort of in perspective of uh, the markets, if you're a government that can say that you want to raise a lots of money, but it's to do things like investing in productive assets, so the green transition, even defence, because it's become such a major policy issue for richer countries, that the market is willing and generous enough to apply this discretion. What they don't like is the sort of sugar us. Uh, short-term paying for your tax cuts, um, obviously maybe politically motivated type of fiscal plans. Is that true? And is there a differentiation that's made uh, in financial markets about the types of sovereign debt that that um, the governments want to issue and for what that money is going to be used for? Thank you. Thanks so, uh, very much uh, for this panel and for sitting here with all the distinguished uh, friends and, and, and colleagues. Uh, listen, I think on this uh, question of debt, there are maybe three buckets that we want to look at. And, and as we're planning, preparing to come to the panel, I was thinking to myself, you know, uh, I, I went and looked a little bit very quickly at NPLs in Europe and the United States, non-performing non loans in the banking system, to just get some sense of, so, okay, sovereigns in emerging markets are not doing so well, but what's happening in some of the emerging market economies. In the uh, uh, household debt in Switzerland, it's the highest it has ever been in the last 30 years. In Sweden, in Denmark, it's almost 128% uh, to 221% uh, uh, debt to income levels on, on the household side. On the banking side, however, and this is uh, uh, an important point that I want to take on, in the whole of the ECB, NPLs are only about 2.2%. Uh, they've actually gone, I think, slightly up or slightly down by 0.02%. Uh, that shows that the, 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 the sort of supervisory and regulatory conditions that were put in in 2008 to sort of manage uh, the financial stability and the soundness of the systems in Europe are working. And so it means if you have the right kind of infrastructure around debt uh, issuances, and then you can actually maybe manage some of the pressures. We saw a spike a little bit in, the, uh, uh, in Europe on NPLs in 2021, 2022, but then it started going down again. In the United States, um, the data just came out yesterday, um, hitting record levels of seven trillion the U.S. has one third of the world's debt. Uh, uh, Japan has what, 225, 255 percent debt to GDP. Uh, uh, we have the average debt to GDP levels in the G7 countries is 128 percent. So this is just sort of. But why are we not talking Spain? Greece is doing a good job. They have actually come down, but they are still at 128 percent debt to GDP levels. All this to say that. Um, one of the things that is happening right now is that we, the global economy is being hit by exogenous shocks and just continuously buffeted. We don't have you know, the kinds of instruments. We have an instrument to manage an Argentina and, and a Sri Lanka some way because there's some very isolated crisis. But when we have systemic global crises, it becomes very difficult to have instruments through which to manage them. It has also been the case that a lot of developing and emerging market economies have gone to the capital markets without the right kinds of instruments, a secondary market, for example. One of the reasons why the corporate sector and uh, uh, even the, the sovereign sector in the United States is doing well is they have repo markets. There's a secondary market for the bond issuances. And so people are willing to buy more paper because there is a way of getting liquidity and coming back in. In the emerging markets, you don't have that. And I have, uh, with a team, uh, founded and created what we are calling the liquidity and sustainability facility to allow for repo markets in emerging, uh, the existence of repo markets for emerging market economies. What does that do? It means that the people that can issue us debt price that debt at much higher cost. And so essentially, when the cost is high, and 2024 is going to be an important year, we have over $80 billion in debt service payments coming due in emerging market economies. Many of these economies are economies that are projected to grow and grow well. But they have this bullet payment in 2024 that they may not be able to meet until something else is done. And I'm working now with the uh, uh, Finance Development Lab in Paris to see whether we can issue 
or maybe bring into being something called the Debt Service Suspension Initiative 2, which is to say there's a group of countries that are projected to grow at 5 6%, so they are going to grow, but they just don't have the $6 billion today to pay that bullet. What do we do with them? Do we send them into default and into a three-year G20 common framework that will not work? Or do we help them over this hump with providing immediate liquidity, which is needed to keep going? And I think we need to look at that and see how we can pass that conversation so that not everybody exactly, as you said, gets into this bucket of, oh, you're going into default, you know, <coughs> you. And so I think if we begin to look at it that way, we begin to see that some of the lessons that we take from the financial sector, the soundness of the financial system, the instruments that were put in in liquidity coverage ratios, the United States now has a standing, two standing repo facilities that are being provided to sort of, I will say, oil the corporate sector in the United States and provide a lot more liquidity for financing investments to continue that growth. At the end of the day, the only way we bring debt down is we grow. And, and how is that message landing when you're discussing this idea of building secondary markets? Obviously, is this the worst possible time to be trying to build these types of instruments because there's <coughs> still a bit of lingering fear around the sort of global monetary policy environment and... And, and fiscal risk generally, or are you actually finding that people are much more receptive than you? We're actually finding that people are much more receptive because, again, as I said, there is a group of countries that's actually growing. Because of the climate uh, transition, there's a lot more investment going into the energy sector. There's a lot more investment going into green ecotourism. There's a lot more investment going into EV vehicles and batteries. A lot of that is coming from the emerging markets, Africa, India, Sri Lanka, where all, I mean, I'm seeing Canada is also doing some of it. But we're all growing because of that. The IRA, huge boost to that sort of research and innovation that will deliver that growth. And so I think we are seeing that there is interest actually from bondholders to come and get the paper. But what they're get facing also is constraints on limits to exposure. A secondary market allows for that to happen. And one of the things that the DSSI-1, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, did is for a country like Cote d'Ivoire, we're not talking about Cote d'Ivoire, they're doing well. But that's because the Debt Service Suspension Initiative acted like a fake repo market. We gave them liquidity. They went to the markets, they restructured their debt, they came back, did better, and are going very well and are doing very well. And I think there's a number of countries, we are seeing the Kenya case now, right? Is Kenya going to do a swap? Is Kenya going to go to the, the common framework? It's Kenya. They have a three billion bullet payment. They are projected to grow at 6%, but they may not be able to make this three billion bullet payment. If they don't make it, they don't grow at 6%, they start falling backwards. And I think there is a very important cost to not helping those countries that just need to get through 2024 and continue growing. But we cannot do it in a sort of, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to pick Kenya because I like Kenya today. Today, the global community is putting about $12 billion behind Kenya. Why not behind Sri Lanka? Why not behind Ivory Coast? Why not behind Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal? I think we need to have a standard format. And that's why we're proposing a debt service suspension initiative too. Through the institutional framework, through the markets framework and sort of the monetary policy side, I think repo markets, swap markets for emerging uh, economies needs to become something that becomes the norm. One of the things that has happened with uh, uh, the, a lot of the work that we're doing is that we've seen a lot of these emerging markets go to the capital markets, but without the infrastructure that is needed for them to survive those places. And so what we've ended up doing is we're bidding up on the credit rating agencies, but they're just doing their job. They're just saying, are you solvent or not? But if you don't have all this swap uh, windows open for you, repo markets that are available, you know, so that you can actually do something, maybe an IRA eventually with some subsidies or a net zero plan from the EU, it's very difficult to survive an environment where, you know, there is four, five, six, seven crises hitting you at the same time. Sure. Um, Ken, we don't have a central bank representative on the panel, but, you know, at previous WEFs, they've very much been under scrutiny. And Maybe is 2024 the year to give them some credit? So if we said, you know, in 2023, 2022, interest rates would be above 5% in the US, they'd be close to 4% in the Eurozone. And this would happen in an environment where not too much has broken in the financial system, although we have had little scares uh, and SVB and, and some sort of panic around American banking was in the spring, but we sort of got over it. The fact that we've managed in the richer Western countries to raise interest rates at a very aggressive pace without necessarily triggering classic sort of debt crises, isn't that a reason 
to sort of celebrate and uh, give them credit? Or, or has this all this happened uh, almost not because of their intentions, but it's been a happy accident instead? Um, Mayreen, I think that's very well put. <laughs> I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's a different country by country, but in the United States, this is basically the second time, knock on wood, if there's a soft landing, that we've had interest rates raised and haven't had a recession. Alan Greenspan was celebrated as the maestro in the early 90s because he was the one who did that the other time. I don't know what Jay Powell's fate will. Well, he was celebrated as the maestro until he became the villain of the financial crisis. So maybe Jay Powell should you know, step down after this term <laughs> if uh, he gets a chance. And uh, so absolutely right. However, I do think this is a little bit part and parcel of the fact that the, the economy wants a higher interest rate. So investors were thinking, oh, zero, they're raising it. Well, if they didn't raise it to something more sustainable, uh, you, we, you know, we would have inflation. And I, I think just to reinforce that point, the, the economies are surviving I'm talking about the rich economies sure. here, pretty darn well with these high interest rates. Why? There isn't a recession, and I think that's partly, well, because we should get used to these high, higher interest rates for all these reasons I mentioned, pop populism, <coughs> high debt, defense, green transition. This is where we are, and that's what something normal is going to look like. Now, I, I mean, I, if I talk about long-term interest rates, I actually think they're about where... I would guess they're going to end up, but of course, short rates will come down, although not maybe that fast. I think precisely because things aren't falling apart, if I were running a major central bank, I'd be taking my time about things because they're trying to feel out where, where are they going to head, where, where are they going to end up, and I, I don't think they know. So j just to push you on this, so you're saying that maybe so, the, so we're getting used to a world of high interest rates which we need? And that also comes with it, we already quite high levels of debt. So have we not just normalized a situation where richer Western countries will have high debt ratios? And sometimes inflation will help them uh, whittle away and inflate away that debt that makes the ratios look a little bit more uh, sustainable than they might not otherwise be. So actually, what, are you describing a period of like a new status quo rather than this idea that we're on the brink and there will be a reckoning and at some point it, something explodes or something gives? First, before I directly answer that, I should say that, you know, clearly this situation is very painful for a lot of people. The interest rates are higher, so if you're a young person in almost any advanced economy, forget about buying a house. I mean, it's really stunning how people have been shut out, and we're talking about emerging markets. But, you know, it, 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 uh, that's a, the question of what happens with inflation, are we going to cycles, a political economy question. Central banks are going to be under a lot of pressure to keep interest rates down. I think if they bring them down uh, too much for too long, we will get these cycles of inflation. But it has to stop at some point because this time, uh, even though the United States effectively defaulted on 10% of GDP worth of debt, and we heard about how many economies benefited this, I mean, Italy as a big debt, they were a huge beneficiary of the inflation we had in, in Europe. But remarkably, uh, it hasn't got built that much into interest rates yet. Next, you know, you know, uh, fool me once, you know, shame on me, fool me, you know, or shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I think that's what we're going to see with interest rates. Uh, and it, so eventually, governments have to adjust. But uh, it may take another cycle of this before that happens. Got it. Thank you. Gonna and I just wanted to yeah, add, course, Vera, in, in this another cycle, as you say, Ken, uh, emerging markets, and in particular Africa, were shut out of the capital markets last year. No African country issued any paper last year. It was just too expensive. So you can compare us almost to the young uh, new home buyers in uh, uh, the United States, the market is just too high. And so we're hoping that there will be some kind of, you know, at least tapering, uh, and maybe not to, you know, zero interest rates where we were before, but hopefully that we begin to see, you know, uh, uh, a little bit of a, a drop that allows a re-entry into the market for those countries because they cannot continue to grow without access to new capital, whether it is from 
a multilateral development system or the capital markets. I also j just want to mention the example of the rich countries, but who was uh, first increasing interest rates successfully, and in my view at the right time, was Latin America. It was Brazil, it was Chile, and, and I do want to give credit because sometimes we only hear about our basket cases, and, and I think this has been extremely successful cases of going first, and, and in fact because they do know that who pays for inflation are the poor people. Like mm. the, the history of inequality and poverty in Latin America is a history of hyperinflation. And so that's probably why they acted first. But also, as, as uh, Ken said, if they don't act, eventually they're gonna have to pay a premium. I mean, the, the term original sin, not being able to issue in your own debt, uh, was coined by Latin Americans. And, and again, Brazil, Chile, Latin America has been very successful in issuing a lot of domestic debt. So we're talking now about countries that have a lot of debt, but it's domestic debt. And I do think it's, it's different the dynamics when, when they manage. But that is also why they want to uh, keep all the good things they have been able to do and thus acted fast. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it does require, and that is the th sad thing about development, if we forget it, it's every day you have to do the right thing because the day you don't, you get punished twice for sins of the past. Yeah, but, but of course, um, uh, likewise in Nigeria, we do have that ability, we do have domestic savings, domestic financial savings to, to raise funds locally, but you know, the elevated um, interest rates, of course, mean that in order to attract foreign portfolio investors in, especially on the debt side, you now have to elevate your own interest rates, and that's where uh, the pain comes in. And, uh, and, uh, and that's where we really feel these elevated interest rates, even though, as you say, everybody stayed out of the international markets last year because it was just uh, too expensive. So, so Ken is basically saying that it would be very risky to do major monetary easing this year, but for a lot of emerging markets, do they actually want to see big rate cuts from the Fed because it would provide them that sort of uh, a bit of breathing room after so so many years of, of, of having to deal with an mm. environment of tight monetary policy? So I guess I don't know how much the Fed uh, is often accused of being, uh, as you would imagine, very US-centric in the way it thinks about monetary policy because it has a domestic inflation target. But of course, this all has consequences for the rest of the world. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions and we will take them in a batch if possible. And I think somebody will come round, hopefully with a microphone. And if you could just let us know who you are. So we have one gentleman there and another gentleman at the front row. And if we've got if anyone wants to add one more, if not, we can, um, we'll get back to the panel. Yeah, so this is the gentleman in the orange tie. Thank you very, <coughs> you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Khatib Basi, former Minister of Finance of Indonesia. Um, I would like to give a comment and I would like to hear the response from the uh, panelists. I think it is inevitable that the government spending will increase due to the green transition, the scarring effect of the pandemic, and also the health issue, and also to protect the vulnerable groups. So one of the solution is to look at on the posture of the fiscal to improve the quality spending. Let me give an example about the fuel subsidy. The phase out the fuel subsidy is very significant because the one who take the benefit is middle and upper income group. And we can use this money to protect the vulnerable groups, also health or anything. At the same time, we probably need to improve the tax revenue. So listen to all the panelists with the possibility of the relatively high interest rate. It will be very difficult for the emerging developing economies to rely so much on, on that. So I would like to hear the response from the panelists. Thank you very much. And just here at the front as well. Just here at the front. Um, hi, Brad Olson. I'm a global shaper and also a New Zealand economist. I guess particularly for the politicians on the panel, who pays? Um, because, I mean, it, yes, we might be on the brink with debt, but we're going to need more of it either for the next crisis or for all of the other you know, investments that need to be made. <coughs> Who actually pays for that, either in terms of higher taxes uh, or you know, services that don't get funded because there's just not en enough money to go around and there has to be prioritisation? Is that low-income people? Is that high-income people? How do you make that choice? Thank you. Okay, so the first, the first question on, on sort of smarter spending by emerging markets and uh, also the idea of energy subsidies, which is something that Nigeria has made progress on trying to phase out. So who wants to, Minister, you can either tackle that one or, and, uh, and also open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, basically, uh, as, as the finance minister, uh, former finance minister said, uh, 
you've got to cut the wasteful spending. <laughs> and um, in Nigeria, nothing was more wasteful than a 2% of GDP spending on subsidy, only 4% of, percent of which went to the poorest 60% of the population. So um, you know, I, I think we ag agree with you. In fact, that's the playbook that uh, we followed. And I, I'm glad you give me an, uh, a chance to sort of um, highlight that. But together, other wasteful spending that we have uh, dealt with is you know, a range of incentives, waivers on import duty, tax exemptions, and so forth, worth another 1% of GDP. So those are the ways in which the fiscal side has been uh, built up. And of course, in terms of revenue, as you say, as I mentioned earlier, it is through digitization um, and through basically, first of all, doing better with the oil sector uh, to raise oil revenue. But in addition to that, all the other aspects of government, uh, federal government revenue enhancement we focused um, tremendously on it, and in six months' time, we'll see the results. And hopefully, it will be that we do hit our um, we do hit our budgetary revenue estimates, and therefore have some uh, have some funds to spend as a government on the social sector, education, and um, and health. But um, the main aim, uh, and I think you you must say, okay, where will all this end? The main aim is that it's a bet on the private sector, it's a bet on investment, domestic investment and foreign investment, foreign direct investment in particular. And um, so, so all the attempts to build government revenue back and stabilize the economy, try and get it growing, get inflation down, particularly food inflation, uh, um, all that attempt is really in order to make the country a viable destination for, for investment because, as we've said here, I mean, we basically see debt markets locked off the international debt markets. Sri Lanka uh, subsidized fuel, which meant you were also subsidizing electricity. Uh, last year, we withdrew all the subsidies. And now the Petroleum Corporation is running at a profit the electricity board is running at a profit. Uh, our from uh, uh, we had a primary deficit of 5.7 percent of the GDP in 2021. There's a budget surplus of 20 uh, in 2023. Our spending on social welfare. We have a program called Lastfest, a new one. That's about uh, we are spending about two and a half times per head than we did under the old one. And the numbers have also, I think, increased by about 40 percent or 30. Yeah. So it, it, it's worked in Sri Lanka. Some other way able to sell it to the people. Uh, final question was on maybe the honesty or dishonesty of some of our politicians by not really confronting the idea of who's going to pay and the idea that this means future generations are paying back for the current policy decisions through higher taxes and impacts on their public services. Is anyone actually doing this well? I mean, I, mean I, <coughs> I just say there has been some learning about that. Of course, the answer is that it, in most cases, the poor suffer the most when you have a debt crisis. But I think particularly in Latin America part, and some other emerging markets, part of the reason in the large emerging markets we haven't seen a debt crisis is they've seen that movie recently enough. So I, I particularly look at Mexico where AMLO, uh, Lopez Obrador, you know, I don't really agree with <laughs> policy, but you know he was not going to have a debt crisis on his watch because he knew it was his people who were going to pay for it. Um, we don't have too long left, so I'm going to end with a sort of nakedly journalistic question, which is one word answer. We haven't spoken too much about politics, but I want to ask the panel the one country maybe in their region or generally from a fiscal perspective where, which is having an elections that they are most worried about. <laughs> you get special points if you don't say the US because that's the one that I imagine most people will want to say. So maybe, Vera, let's start with you and then we can go around counterclockwise. We don't have to elaborate, uh, just South Africa. South Africa. Man, as I'm trying to think in, in Latin America who's having an election that uh, Mexico and Mexico? Panama. Yeah. But, 
I'm actually not that worried about Maxi Bass, I think. Ken? Um, I, I'm sorry, but I'm paralyzed <laughs> yes. by the we US. We didn't expect anything <laughs> else. We didn't expect it. <laughs> Finance Minister? Syria Alun. Okay. And finally, President. Sri Lanka. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly, that's probably the right answer. Um, and we have yeah. Pakistan and India. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The politician worry about his own country's election. That's what we, that's what we like to hear. Uh, that's the end of the session. Thank you so much, um, everyone on the panel. I think that was a very wide-ranging discussion. And uh, luckily, unlike a lot of the um, chats that I have in Davos, it was not entirely Europe or Western-centric, which is always very good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And hopefully we'll see you. Thank around. you very much.